In the last video, we looked at some common morphemes that usually accompany nouns. In this video, we will do the same with verbs. Again, there's no possible way that we could cover them all because there's a lot of things that verbs do in human languages, but we'll look at some major types of morphemes that attach to verbs. For example, we can have agreement, where there's information on the verb about who's doing the action and maybe who the action is being done to. We can have tense, which is the temporal relationship of the action to other points in time. Maybe our action is, this is now, and an action, our action is in the past, or this is now, or, and our action is in the future, and so forth. Aspect is the internal temporal structure of an action. So whether an action is now complete, or maybe the action is continuous, or maybe the action is habitual, like I eat today, I eat tomorrow, I eat the other day, and so on. We, verbs can have mood, which is my attitude towards the action, whether something actually happened, whether something hasn't happened but might happen, whether I'm giving you an order, and so forth. And verbs can have evidentiality, which is my evidence for telling you that it's raining. Maybe I felt the rain on my arm. Maybe I'm inferring it from how it sounds on the roof, and so forth. So let's take a look at each of these. Agreement might be familiar to you. In many languages, the verb does carry information about who is doing the action. For example, in English, we have she walks. And that little s tells you that whoever's doing the action is he, she, or singular they. In Spanish, the, verb, the verbs camino, caminas, caminamos, caminan are the same verb, except for there's a morphine that tells you that I walk, that you walk, that we walk. So you have some info about who's doing the action. In many languages, there's info about the subject, but also about the object, about who the action is being done to. In Swahili, for example, we have the word ni likona. So ni tells you that it was I who was seeing. Li tells you that the action is in the past. Ona tells you that it's the verb to see. And ku means that the seeing is happening onto you that I see you. So nilikona has agreement with both subject and the direct object. In uliniona, u tells you that it's you who is doing the seeing, li, the past, ona, si, and ni is telling you that the one who's getting seen is me. Uh, so uliniona means you saw me. So as you can see, the verb agrees with both subject and object. Tense might be familiar to you. It indicates the relationship of the action to other points in time. For example, in English, we have the past, I went, or the future, I will go. Uh, languages can split the continuum of time in other ways. For example, Bribri has two types of past tense. It has the recent past for something that happened today, but before, like in the morning, and we have the remote past, which is something that happened yesterday or some day before that. So for example, jetse, I sung, means that I sung earlier today. Whereas jetse, I sung in the remote past, means that I sung yesterday or a year ago and so forth. So tense is the relationship between you and the time of the action. Aspect is the internal temporal structure of the action, like how the action unfolded. For example, in Spanish, those two words, yo canté, yo cantaba, both of, the, both of them are in the past tense. However, the first one is in the perfect aspect. It tells you that I was singing and then I stopped, like I sung that one time. We call this the perfect. You can have yo cantaba, which is the imperfect, which means that something was continuing and there was no clear end point, like I used to sing. English has the progressive aspect, which tells you that an action uh, sim similar to the imperfect is extending over time. So I am reading means that the action is still ongoing and shall continue to go on into the future. Um, African-American vernacular English has an aspect called the habitual, which uh, means that you perform the action again and again and again. I be eating, for example, means that you eat today and tomorrow and the day after that, and you do this in a continued fashion. 
Many languages have habituals. Turkish has habitual more, uh, aspects, for example. There's many aspects. Kawiya has one called the inquitive aspect, uh, which tells you that something is just beginning. So kup means to sleep. Kupichu means to become sleepy, to be starting to sleep. Um, Latin, for example, have had inquitive aspect too. All right, so tense is the, the relationship in time and aspect is the internal uh, temporal structure, whether something stops or continues. Mood is your attitude towards the action, whether something actually happened or it hasn't happened, but might. Spanish has mood. So in the, in the word cantas, you sing, this uh, uh, verb is in the indicative mood, telling you that it did in fact happen. You in fact sing. Um, Quiero que cantes, I want you to sing, has this word cantes in the subjunctive, because I can't force you to sing. Maybe you'll sing if you want to, but you haven't sung yet. I want you to sing means that it might happen, hasn't happened, but maybe it will. Um, so this is called the subjunctive. In the structure, por favor canta, please sing. This verb is in the imperative, so I'm asking you to do the action, to sing. We call these mood. Languages can have any combination of these. Some languages don't have agreement. In Swedish, you don't have anything in the verb that tells you whether it's I or you who's doing the action. Um, some languages can have aspect but not tense. Some languages can have tense and not aspect. Or you can be like Spanish and have everything in one vowel. So the verb cante, I sung, has the root cant and then the e, which is the first person singular, so I, the past tense, it happened in the past, the perfective aspect, so I sung once and I'm done, and the indicative mood. So I do know, in fact, that I sung. Um, so you can have all of those meanings packed into a single morpheme. The, uh, the verb canten, that you sing or may you sing, has the root cant, and then the n has the second person plural, so you all, the present tense, the imperfect aspect, so I want you to continue to sing or to keep on going to sing for a little bit, and subjunctive. So it hasn't happened, but maybe it will. Que canten, that you sing. We want you to sing. Finally, many languages mark evidentiality, which is a description of how I obtained the information or how confident I am of what I'm saying. In Quechua, for example, you can have the verbs para shanmi, para shansi, para shancha. This one means it's raining. I'm sorry for the misalignment. So para is the root to rain. Sha is the progressive aspect. The N is the third person, so it. And then me tells you that this is direct evidence. Like it's raining and I'm telling you because I just got some water on me. Parashanmi means I directly know it's raining. Parashansi means that it's hearsay. So I've, I've been told it's raining and that's why I'm saying it right now. Parashancha has the conjecture evidential. It means that maybe I hear something on the roof, maybe I know at this time of day it should be raining, so I say Parashancha, it might be raining, it's probably raining. These are markers of evidentiality. Turkish has evidentials, for example. So as you can see, verbs can do many things. There's many types of morphemes that can go with verbs. For example, agreement, information about who is doing the action, who the action is being done to. Tense, which is my relationship to the timeline. Aspect, which is the manner, the structure of, in which the action is performed. Maybe it has a concrete ending. Maybe it has no concrete ending. Maybe it happens discreetly, but many times. This is the habitual. Mood is my attitude towards the action. It did happen. It might happen. I'm telling you to do the thing. And evidentiality, which means how I know about something. Maybe I have evidence. Maybe I'm inferring from existing evidence. Maybe I heard about it.